Hey everyone, welcome back. So we're back with our marker and paper style of videos. Um, I've been mentioning in some of these other videos, but some people like this style better because there's less clutter around the screen. Other people like the whiteboard style better because it's a real person kind of delivering information. I'm not really partial to either one. I want to do which one works better for the viewers here. So go ahead and let me know which one you like better in the comments below, and I'll take that into account. But the main focus of the video today is a really cool trick in linear algebra called the change of basis. And more than just being a trick, it's super helpful. It comes up in all different kinds of research papers, applications, basically all over the place. So let's dive into it. First, I'm going to ask you kind of a guiding question. What does it mean to talk about this coordinate or this vector 1, 2? Well, you probably know this from basic algebra. You just go one unit across on the x-axis, two units up on the y-axis, and boom, you got your point. If you want to get a little fancier, you can draw an arrow from the origin and you got your vector. So what more is there to talk about? Let's unpack this a little bit as we move our way towards the change of basis. So this, written in a more kind of clunky, but maybe more specific form, is 1 times this vector, which we're going to call E1. E1 is a unit vector in the x-axis direction. I called it this because you'll see it called that in most textbooks. Plus 2 times this E2 vector, which is a unit vector in the positive y direction. So this is doing exactly what we talked about in words. We're going one unit in the positive x direction and two units in the positive y direction, and that lands us at our one, two vector. Now, to drop the name basis for the first time, these vectors, E1 and E2, form a basis for this space, this R2 space. And E1 specifically is going to be one, zero, because it's one unit in the x direction and zero units in the y direction by definition and E2 is going to be 0, 1 for similar reasons. But the big thing to note here is that although we've been studying coordinates in this system since the beginning of learning algebra, this is arbitrary. We pick these because it's convenient for us to draw, this is the way people do it usually, but we could have well chosen some other basis which wish to represent our coordinate space. In other words, E1 and E2 are arbitrary. For example, what if we want to switch things up and want to use this instead as the basis, where the first basis vector is 2, 1, which is this vector v1, and the other basis vector is negative 1, 1, which looks like this. Notice these guys are not even perpendicular to each other, but at the same time, they span the entire space. What that means in a less technical language is that if I have any vector in this two-dimensional space, I can uniquely represent it as some linear combination of these two vectors, and that means that I can use this as my basis just as well. So now diving a little bit deeper into the mathematics here, let's suppose that you have basis A is given by these two basis vectors, a1 and a2. I'll be putting these arrows in this video just because it makes a little bit clearer what's a coefficient and what's a vector. And let's say we have some other basis b, which is given by basis vectors b1 and b2. And furthermore, let's say that we can translate basis vectors like this. So basis vector b1 is equal to x11 times basis vector a1 plus x12 times basis vector a2. And similarly for b2. So let me backtrack a little bit because I've just been speaking in formula for the last minute. Basically, we have these two bases, which is the plural of basis, and we're saying that you can represent one basis, basis B, as some linear combinations of the original basis, which is basis A. So let's say we have some kind of vector V. So V is just some arbitrary vector in the space. And let's say that V can be represented as V1 times basis vector 1 plus V2 times B2. So v1 and v2 here are numbers, coefficients. And this is saying that if we combine the coefficients in this way with these two basis vectors, we get the vector that we currently care about. But we actually know b1 and b2 in terms of a1 and a2. That's what these formulas we're talking about here. So we can go ahead and just straight up plug them in. So I go ahead and plug in uh, this top form here for b1, and I plug in this bottom form here for b2. I rearrange just a little bit, and now I get the same vector v, so notice this guy's vector v and this guy is the same exact vector v. The top is the formulation of this vector v in terms of the second basis, and now I can also represent it in terms of the first basis. So now to start collecting these things in terms of coefficients, we're saying that the coefficients of my vector v in terms of basis a are v1 x11 plus v2 x21, and the other coefficient is v1, x12, plus v2, x22. Where am I getting these from? 
these are exactly the forms you see here. So we're saying that V is represented as this much of A1 plus this much of A2, and therefore those are called my coefficients of basis A. Now this I can write in terms of a matrix vector multiplication, just like this, so you can confirm that this form is the same as this form up here. But now you can see looking at it in this form, that if we call this purple matrix here X, then coefficients of A is equal to this purple matrix X times the coefficients of our vector V in the basis B. And that is true because V1 and V2 are the exact coefficients you need in order to represent this vector V in terms of the basis B1, B2, which again is basis B. The whole punchline here, if I take this matrix X and I invert it and I slap it on the left side here, is that if I have the coefficients of any vector V in some basis A, then I, all I need to do is multiply it by this matrix inverse, and that will give me the coefficients of that vector V in this completely new basis B. And now let me note really quick why it's important. What is the significance of this guy being invertible? If we look at how X is defined, it looks like this. And the reason it needs to be invertible, for example, under what condition would this matrix not be invertible? That would be if the second column was a linear combination of the first column. If the second column was a linear combination of the first column, that would mean that this basis vector, B2, is a linear combination of the first basis vector, B1, and that is not good. You cannot have basis vectors that are parallel to each other, which is what it would mean for this guy to be a linear combination of this guy. The reason you can't have that is because you cannot span the whole space. So there's a secret kind of cool thing going on that the fact that this guy needs to be invertible enforces that you need the basis vectors not to be parallel to each other, or as you get into higher dimensions, enforces that they need to span the entire space. So in the original problem we were looking at, if we go ahead and apply this technique, we were looking to represent our basis now as 2, 1 and negative 1, 1. Let me just flash back to this paper here to remind you of that. 2, 1 and negative 1, 1. We can represent that as 2 times E1 plus 1 times E2. We can represent the second potential basis vector as negative 1 times E1 plus 1 times E2. So that coefficients of B are given by this matrix inverse, which I just grabbed these coefficients, times the uh, representation of this vector in terms of the original basis, which was E1 and E2, which was just 1 and 2. And that gives me 1, 1. So if I did my math correctly, that tells me that I can represent the same vector, 1, 2, as these coefficients in terms of my new basis vectors. Is that true? If I took one of these plus one of these, I would get 2 minus 1, which is 1. And I would get 1 plus 1, which is 2, which is exactly what I had in the original basis. So this is exactly correct. And finally, let's talk about why should we care? Is this just some kind of mathematical magic trick, or is there actually some applications to this? There are tons of applications to this. You'll see this in many, many research papers and industry applications, but one that comes to mind is PCA, Principal Component Analysis. If we have this cloud of data points, originally represented in E1 and E2, then it takes two times n numbers to store this, because there's n data points, and we need to know for each data point what is the contribution from E1 and E2, but let's say we change our basis to just this single 1, 1 vector. Then, if we're willing to lose a little bit of information here, then we're able to just require n numbers, because I just need to know what is the contribution in that direction for each data point, which PCA will tell you is the dominant direction here. And so we basically cut the amount of data storage we need in half by just using a new basis instead of the original E1, E2 basis to store our data. So tons of applications, PCA is one of them. If you learned something in this video, please like and subscribe, and I will catch you next time.